In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters, today brings us to the Sunday of the Holy Fathers, when we commemorate those bishops who gathered for the First Ecumenical Council way back in the early part of the 4th century. This was a time in history when there was a great debate about who Jesus Christ is, while the 3rd century had more or less resolved the question of whether he is truly human. The 4th century would see the question of whether he was truly divine and the, the ramifications uh, of this question. And so, to resolve this question, the bishops of the church were invited to attend a council and to gather to rightly divide the word of truth. That is, to, get, to divide truth from falsehood. And so they did, declaring Jesus Christ to be the Son of God and that he is truly and fully God alongside the Father and the Holy Spirit, with the Trinity being three and yet one. <clears throat> Knowing this council was, uh, one, was one that was attended primarily by bishops, where, where these, these men were, uh, were tasked with dividing the word of truth, brings us to a, a consideration of the clergy itself. As we know, we have minor clergy, readers and subdeacons, which have defined liturgical roles, which are essentially what the titles would indicate. In parishes, we're likely to find deacons and priests. A deacon has a very important role to assist the priest or to assist the bishop if he's there. And that role is certainly liturgical, but it takes other forms in addition to this, charitable, administrative, educational, and more. A priest, as a father of a community, leads this community in prayer. He administers the sacraments and does his best to represent his bishop under whose authority he serves. Understandably, we're most familiar with the, each of these ranks, and it's not uncommon for us to see examples of these ranks in person. Yet there is one further rank, that of bishop. And our bishops are held to a difficult task. They're given a title which literally means overseer. And this is exactly what they do. They oversee a diocese, which is a collection of parishes spread out over a given area. And it's, this is not done simply for the sake of bureaucracy or simply for the sake of administrative busy work. This is done to teach truth to their flock and to ensure that truth is not commingled with falsehood, or as we say in our services, they are to rightly divide the word of truth. As we know through the history of our church, many of the great questions of theology have already been settled. We have had ecumenical councils and other councils whose decisions have been accepted across the church, which has defined and proclaimed our faith in the Trinity, in the God-man Jesus Christ, our understanding of the end times, the implications of our belief that Jesus Christ became human, our understanding of who leads the church on earth, and the primacy of prayer in interacting with God, and many more besides. Great questions have continued to arise even through to our own day. Questions of ecclesiology, of bioethics, apologetics, among many, many others. And each of these continue to be, to be flashpoints for our theological luminaries. It would be easy to point to a single point of contact to resolve each of these questions. One person that can make a declaration on a problem and it is so. It would likewise be easy to make each point of contact unaccountable so that any person can make a declaration and it applies to themselves. And thus it is so for them without being necessarily binding or anyone feeling like it's binding on anyone else. The church, however, chose a different way. It chose to avoid a single point of failure, and yet it chose to ensure accountability. It does this through something called conciliarity, which is how it is that we make, that we make these great decisions, these, um, these decisions of cosmic importance. While there are individual bishops who make, make the case for one side or for the other, debate may ensue once the episcopacy has gathered and spoken, and this has been accepted by the church, then the matter is simply settled. For this reason, it's of the utmost importance 
that we, that we respect our bishops, that we support them as they shoulder this great burden now and into the future. In each of our liturgical services, we pray for the bishops who are responsible for us. Right from the head of our local church, Patriarch Kadil of Moscow, through to the head of our synod and diocesan bishop, Metropolitan Hilarion, to our diocesan administrator, Bishop George of Canberra, where times past had a bishop looking after a city and its immediate surrounds, perhaps, perhaps like the greater Brisbane area in, in, our own, uh, in our own context. In times today, a bishop, our bishop looks after a diocese that spans across an entire continent, that spans across that to the na our neighbouring country, New Zealand, and, and more neighbouring countries aside. Knowing the diversity within our own country and multiplying this for different countries, we should thus be inspired to still greater prayer, knowing the difficulty of the task ahead. And therefore, brothers and sisters, I ask you to use our public prayer as a guide for your private prayers. Those who have a spiritual responsibility for us, for ourselves, for our families, for our community, have a great burden. And prayer is one of the ways in which we can help these responsible people to shoulder their responsibility. Likewise, there are people that we have responsibility for, our children, our students perhaps, those who look to us as role models. And therefore, let us pray for those who have responsibility for each of us and those whom we have a responsibility for. Let us pray for each of these, whether individually or together, in family or in community. Because it is by doing this that we can begin to follow the words of the Apostle Paul, who asked the Galatians and who asked us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen.